do today is sort of aggregate a lot of the data that we've collected over the last seven years. Um, we've run a lot of TV commercials, and uh, I thought it would be interesting to, to look back and see what a typical 30-second spot looks like from literally thousands of ads. Um, what is the time course? Does that tell us anything about the brain uh, that would be useful for market, marketing? And um, let's make sure I just do this one right here. Yeah. So yes, the uh, other collaborator is my son. Uh, and poor guy. Uh, he's had electrodes put on him uh, as long as he can remember. And um, he tried to get away, but um, went into physics. And then he, he ended up in an MEG laboratory in Albuquerque, doing exactly what he did as a kid. And then I said, you know, you could come work for me. And so that's where he is now. And does most of the analysis. Okay, um, a, a typical uh, TV commercial in the United States is about a 30 second affair, although that's changing and they're getting shorter. Um, if you're rich and you run a 60 or 90 second spot, you can do that in the Super Bowl. Uh, but in general, most ads, if you sample them, are around 30 seconds. And of course, that's mainly in the United States and, the, and throughout the world that can vary quite a bit. Um, uh, and the goal of a, of a TV commercial is to produce some um, attention, uh, capture some attention in a mass audience. Now, someone may be walking by and just looking at a screen. Um, someone may be zooming by with their, um, with their uh, high speed remote which pretty much everybody does these days. Um, and because of the clutter that's out there in uh, uh, TV world, which is still relevant, has, um, has to break through and create a desire uh, for the purchase of a product. And, and so the amount of money, as we all know, spent on the production of a TV commercial and following that even more money with respect to a buy, um, probably does warrant careful attention to how a, um, a, a TV commercial is going to perform. Um, and what I wanted to address in this talk is uh, that although we know a lot about attention and memory, neuroscientists know uh, quite a bit about that, it's very rare that you actually see that applied to real media. Uh, typical experiment is very carefully, implicitly, or inherently designed to study some aspect of attention, whether it's attention switching or sustained attention or, or some sort of memory recall and so on. And it's almost always uh, hypothesis driven. Um, but uh, looking at it from more of a um, anthropological or external uh, validity, um, there's, there's very little out there in the uh, neuroscience world. So um, we just have that unique opportunity where we have collected, gathered lots and lots of commercials and thought, well, what's the overall What's the overall waveform that um, uh, represents a, a TV commercial? And what does that tell us about how people are attending, remembering, uh, or not attending to a commercial? And furthermore, what are the areas of the brain that get activated? Which counts? Now, starting around 1990, um, um, 
an important figure in neuroscience, Rachel, uh, discovered that there are these slow oscillations in the brain. And he followed through on that, being a good scientist that he is, and said, you know, there's these slow potentials that are going on. And they don't seem to be correlated at all to tasks that people are doing, because our mindset as experimentalists is to present something as a task to somebody, and so you're off task and you're on task. And you could think of the TV commercial as an on task uh, behavior, where you're, you know, sit in the scanner and we want to show you something and pay attention, and then there'll be a break. So then he asked that question, but what's going on in the break? You know, what is it? It's the dark matter, if you will, for the brain. And he found that there's completely different circuitry involved in, um, in, in these slow in-between times. And, it, and as it turns out, these slow potentials um, correlate perfectly with slow potentials recorded in the scalp. And then, likewise, the on-task um, slow potentials also correlate very well. But it's down in the frequencies in the EEG that everybody ignores. That is below one cycle per second. And, and what we found is that if we look at the full bandwidth across all frequencies of the EEG, um, and I, I assume we, we've sort of already gone over a lot of that with the different types of um, uh, parts of the spectrum of the EEG and, and how they relate. And, and it's also hard, I think, for people to synthesize together. What do all these different frequencies mean? You know, there's all these different things that can be derived from the EEG, and they're all relevant. Um, but what we did is we just averaged it all together and threw it in one pot and said, let's just see what falls out. And, and so what we did is we, uh, we studied approximately 1,200 TV commercials um, from many countries all over. Um, the subject size was approximately 2,500 people. So it's a really large sample. And most importantly, um, each TV commercial was presented only once. That is, there was no repetition. And anybody who has done EEG or fMRI, looked at the, in the scanner, knows that repetition is a big deal. You know, the, the signal that comes from the fMRI, it's very, very small. You know, these pretty pictures that we look at, oftentimes are the result of people sitting in the scanner for some time to bring up the signal and, from the noise. And um, what we have found is that these really slow potentials are quite robust and that we can see the effects on one single presentation given that the subject does not sneeze or do something in the middle of it and which of course we have to throw out. Uh, so these are what are called single trial presentations, not average presentations. Okay, and then uh, also we wanted to make the uh, experience to be as real as possible. Uh, it is, they've all been presented in the context of a TV show. The TV shows are random, uh, they're relatively mild in nature, and, um, uh, and then they're randomized in the pod, and the pods are randomized. So, so that the effects of what came before isn't going to influence, um, hopefully, too much what the commercial is, is, is about. So, um, what I'm going to show you is the results of what's called full bandwidth EEG, or FEEG. It's, it's an emerging field in EEG where you record everything. Why not? We can do it now. We didn't used to be able to do that. But um, because of improvements in technology, uh, there's really no reason to bandwidth limit. Um, that is to only record a small segment of the 
EEG. You're just losing data. In fact, if you look at the spectrum of the EEG, it gets larger and lower the frequencies. Most of what is going on in the brain that's making it through your skull is in the low frequencies. And why? The same reason the, the sun is red on the horizon and the sky is blue. The high frequencies scatter and don't make it through the skull. The low frequencies make it through the skull. And the skull has different thicknesses to it, doesn't it? In particular, there's some very thin portions of the skull right along here. You know, we don't have a lot of, as we evolved, we didn't have a lot of accidents that were on the side. They're front and back. Your skull is thicker in the back, especially. And it's thinner right here. In fact, you can just, with a, um, a skull, you can just shine a flashlight and see the light very easily. Well, that's the same thing that's going on in EEG. The low frequencies are just making it right through to those sensors. And they're easy to record. Okay. Now, the other thing we've done is to verify uh, these results is we've, we've also recorded the EEG while the person's in the MRI scan. That is, a lot of this data we have co-validated along with, uh, you know, the, they watch the TV, but they're sitting in an fMRI scanner, and we look to see what's activated. Although, you know, delayed, um, there are techniques in fMRI where you can pretty much guess what, what happened. The reason the EEG is so nice is because it's instantaneous. And today it's an emerging standard actually in medicine. Um, uh, I just installed a system at Baylor College of Medicine where the doctor said she couldn't think of doing EEG and fMRI separately. That is, is now getting to the point, just like the, the history of EEG, it went from the big hospitals and the research clinics to eventually it was in everybody's um, you know, practice. Every neurologist has an EEG machine for the most part. And the same thing is happening now with EEG and fMRI, although fMRI is still quite expensive. So let's get to some data. What I want to show you is um, what's called independent components analysis. It's used a lot in the imaging community. Uh, and I use it um, to tell what's going on in, uh, in the data itself. Um, and you'll, you'll notice there's, there are three squiggles right here. And, and then there's a pattern that's associated with it. What it. The pattern that you see right here is a, um, a flattening of, this, of the electrodes that would be on somebody's head. So that we would take that and cartographically flatten them so that you're looking at a pattern. So the, the orientation of all this is that this is the front, left, right, and back. So we see a pattern where there is a very big response back in the visual area of the brain. And, and notice the waveform that is associated with that independent component. Now I should say what independent components analysis is, it's a statistical technique. It's, it's a technique in which we take the spatial patterns and we try to find some patterns that account for most of the variability in the data. It's done automatically. There's no human intervention. And in the one that accounts for most of the variance is at the top, and that is the visual cortex and parietal lobe. That makes sense, because what is the most active area of the brain? The visual cortex. The visual cortex is huge and, and requires most of the, you know, the blood flow. It's why when you stand up quickly, you see stars. And that's because you're just need a little more blood, a little more oxygen for that visual cortex to work. Um, and then there's another interesting pattern, which is um, a spike at the beginning. And it's coming from the ventral areas of the human brain, the frontal areas, that are much more involved in motivation, decision-making, 
uh, engagement, and so on. And notice how it starts up and then pretty much stays flat the whole time. It's not, it's not really doing anything except probably saying, pay attention. Pay attention to this. So we're going to see where that's coming from. And then there's another interesting one. And this is about all we can extract from it. There seem to be three processes that are major in any video presentation. And that is an onset potential. Where you see the sharp onset right here. And then another one that's inverted that is at the end of the TV commercial. That's the stop. Pay attention, disengage. We've looked at this and we have found that this is controlling the parietal lobe. And that we literally are having brain areas couple and decouple. Say the frontal lobe is saying, okay, pay attention to that. That looks interesting. Okay, we're done. And they become critical when you design it. Um, and these principles can be applied to the design of TV commercials. And, and that's what I, I really want you to take this home with the fact that brain does really a couple of things. It says pay attention, use that massive posterior area of your brain to process all the sensory modalities and then disengage because we're going off to another task. And we can judge how well a TV commercial is doing based on the onset potential, the sustained response, the first two independent components that come out of this. Okay, so that's just it a little bigger. And, and for those who are statistically oriented, I'm talking about signal to noise ratios that are in the high 40s, 40 decibels. That's really, really loud. And that means it's also really easy to record. That's why I can record one sweep and tell something about uh, something. Because we all know that if you've seen a commercial once, Pretty much you've seen it, right? Second time, it's a reprise. Okay, yeah, well that's something I've missed. Third time, you're not paying attention. You got, I got that. I don't need to see that. And in a short period of time, that's exactly what happens, is that uh, the attention goes down precipitously at, from three on presentations than any TV commercial. Now there may be um, dishabituation to the commercial that could happen weeks later, but we have found immediately that people stop paying attention. That's no surprise. Okay, so what does that look like? What does that look like in a brain? This is a brain. It's an average brain. It's from Canada. It is an average of 156 Canadians. Okay, so I apologize if you're not Canadian. Your head may shape, be shaped a little differently. But this comes from the Montreal Neurological Institute, and it's a standard for brain imaging. And, and they keep coming out with better and better versions of it. I'm hoping that they're going to come up with different, um, uh, different races and shapes of heads at some point. Because when I was giving a talk in, in China a while back, I put the electrodes in. It, it was a great joke. They were all in the wrong spot. And, you know, the heads, heads vary in their shape tremendously. But let me play this movie. See if I can do that. Okay. I'm just going to play this over and over again. And you notice that this was very short. This is this component right here. And now watch very carefully, and you'll see that right here, the inferior portion of the frontal lobe, which is the same area, by the way, that we see in fMRI, 
um, and the anterior portions of what's called the, you know, the temporal lobe down here, we're looking at the brain from the front, are going to activate for a very brief period of time. There it is. That's the onset potential. Now there's, there's other stuff going on that's behind on the other side. So what you're seeing is the areas of the brain that say effectively pay attention. And I'm going to later bring that back in and show why that's important when you design that. Okay, now here's a view from the back part. And this is going to be that sustained response. Oops, excuse me. <coughs> so this is a 30 second movie. Probably sped up faster than 30 seconds. Look at that. It's sustained, isn't it? One way to look at the parietal and visual cortex is sort of the movie screen, if you will, of all the different modalities that get synthesized into this portion. It's Now, right down here is the visual cortex. Of course, it's active, but I've raised the threshold so that uh, it emphasizes the really big responses. And, and so what we're seeing is areas of the brain that the inferior part of the parietal lobe just stays active and hot the whole time throughout the presentation. Now, if it's a bad ad and people lose attention, what happens is this doesn't go on. This gets really low. And basically the frontal lobe says, eh, you know, not very interested and resources aren't allocated and the commercial tax. It's very predictive of what's going to happen to a commercial. In fact, so predictive that we can now say things about the distribution of um, how active that is. And most of the activation is coming, let's see if we can see this here. It is normally distributed, and this is 658 samples um, and bend into um, roughly one one standard deviation. So each one of those bins, each score, this is a normalized score or a z-score, if you will. So we leave the, the dimensions of, um, of you know, absolute values because actually the voltages that you're seeing in the previous movies have to do with electricity. Um, and people aren't going to relate to that at all. I said, well, that's you know, 90 microampers. Uh, people are going to go buy. Yeah. Question? Yeah. Sam, research. You do work for commercial producers. That's that you're consulting practice. You actually do work for uh, television producers. We actually work for. I didn't catch the last part. Okay, so you're not doing actual consulting work for like a, a, a brand of producing television. All the time. Oh, okay. Yeah. So if you ever, and you just said that like that. Third time someone sees a commercial, it's pretty well, you know, they're not even paying attention. Have you ever ever advised them to just tweak the commercial a bit to, to get that uh, differential? We do our very best to do that. <laughs> <laughs> and what's the response to that? It's quite fair. Um, some places take us to heart. Some people get very upset. Uh, generally you're messing with the creative, right? That, that's, um, that's a very excellent question. Um, and it is, everybody who is in this business experiences this. Um, you, you sit there, and typically no study is done, a neural study is done in the context of other testing. And um, the, you know, we, for example, I think I can talk about this, you know, we, we did the uh, movie trailer, Rang, um, uh, Rango. Rango had a spider in it. And we took out the spider. Successfully. Because it was very negative. And 
Um, and we had good reason to take out this guy because there is an involuntary response to that for primates in general. And, um, and so, yes, we, we definitely get involved in it, um, which is getting to sort of my last point when we, we get to, to the why, use, why do all this effort. Um, but we do have this distribution. So if you...
just knocked it out of the park. And um, you can see the lift at the end, the, you know, the empathy, um, negative response, where he, nothing's working, oh boy, and then he gets excited. And I looked at this ad and I found out who made it and I went over to the um, uh, to Deutsche Media in Los Angeles and I said, you've got to run this, just out of the blue. I said, who are you? <laughs> and I said, you know, I, I ran your ad, the name is, his name is Doug Van Prey. and. He wrote a, a, a book also that is entertaining. Um, and this ad went viral. It was way past the distribution. It's the top one on the far right. And um, so if you look at what's going on there, is there was no question this ad was a viral ad. And, um, and our neural measures um, there have to be actually, the, the waveforms look smaller, but we had to scale it down by three times to put it on the screen. It was just so large. And um, then the next year, uh, VW said, well, that worked. So let's do another one. You may remember this one. But 
it, they're dis, they're, I know it's German meat and you wanted to somehow make this all work, but you got over creative. Keep it simple. And they did rerun it and the yeah, did extremely well. They cut that off. And, you know, complexity um, is what's the, you know, better is the uh, evil of good or something like that. You don't want to overdo it. And uh, so we can track very closely. And it's, you may have an intuition about an ad, and if you've seen a lot of ads, you, and, and people do, they say, you know, let's, let's cut this, let's cut that. But what the neuromarketing does for people is it confirms it. Or it gives you a path for um, uh, further research. Uh, for example, we ran some ads, and I think um, AT&T would not mind me saying something about this, but they had a, a very complex program that they ran where um, the uh, AT&T found everywhere, and we had concatenated cities together on billboards. And we had commercials with backgrounds changing. That commercial series did worse than flashing lights. You would have done better by flashing a light into the retina than, than doing, spending all that money. And I presented that. I ran it several times. And I presented that to the, to the manager at the time. And he said, I was, you know, afraid of what was going to happen next. And he said, dang, I wish I had this data. I knew someone was wrong about that. And there it is. It's right there in front of you. You know, this ad is never going to go anywhere. So what's one of the more powerful things about these techniques is they'll really show you when you've got a flop. It's easy. Um, so um, just to con con conclude here, you know, all of our studies always include traditional quantitative and qualitative measures. Um, it's very rare that we do it by itself. If we do it by itself, there's usually some other group that's also testing it in some other way. Uh, neuromarketing is still a new technology, and it's going to take some time before uh, it's finally, you know, accepted for by itself. Um, a typical finding is that there is either some correspondence or a hint that matches some of the, uh, the results we're seeing with the brain. The difference is that we see it with far fewer subjects and it's usually more robust. And I can conclude that after six or seven years of doing just that and seeing, sitting in with the focus groups and analysis it's usually the neuromarketing that wins the day. I can say that now at the end, end of all of this, that um, there's just so much more power in, in these techniques. Um, and the imaging component for us really brings us insights into why an ad is doing well or poorly. If the intent was to have a strong um, musical component to it, and you're not lighting up the music areas of the brain. You know, it may be completely different from what you think. And, and we can say something to that. Or, if it's confusing, we see sustained responses from the orbital frontal lobe. Uh, it's usually the result of confusion. You know, generally what we see from the frontal lobe are very quick responses. We're engaged, disengaged, engaged, disengaged. But when we see a sustained orbital frontal response where a person's having to allocate resources to solve the problem, there's a problem. And I think I'll um, and, and conclude also, where should these techniques be applied? They should be applied in the very early stages of development of a concept. It's really disappointing at the end to just say, well, you did, I guess it affects the buy, but the, the, the commercial's already been produced. It's unlikely to be changed. And so if you can get your, get in at the storyboard level and, and 
and convince the creatives that you're their friend, not their enemy. Um, you stand the most for success. So I'll stop there and uh, answer any other questions you might be. Yeah? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. European, they were doing a test for a European beer maker, and they had three beer labels that they were testing. You know, label number one did okay, label number two did okay, label number three was just off the chart. It had a uh, positive response, but uh, he didn't want to just be pick label number two. It was crazy character. So he, still, he didn't like that. He didn't like the one that was actually the most positive uh, response. Right. Is that what you're coming up against with a lot of the oh, yeah. characters? Oh, yeah. We had an Australian winemaker that did the exact same thing. They wanted to break away a very well known brand. Um, and and change it completely over to you know make it look like it was more expensive wine and I strongly suggest not to do that because they're effectively wiping out the brand when they were already doing that. They went ahead and did it, sales were terrible. <laughs> and you know it's you know you don't get that chance, you just, the only thing you can do is consult and say, uh, you know, nobody's recognizing this, this label, um, and there's no association with it, with anything, and... Is that what you find your biggest challenge is, working with these companies, is just the, it's kind of like you're questioning their creative ability? Do you want to carry like this? Yes, and, um, and it's, it's probably the hardest when you have created it. Um, and usually, a lot of times it's in a foreign language that I don't understand. <laughs> so, so I'm sitting back there and I know everybody's screaming. <laughs> and I don't really hear what it's about. And, um, uh, but I've, I've, I've just spent some very negative news. And, and, but, you know, people adjust. And, now it'll, it'll start them thinking. The real advantage to these techniques is it does prompt people to uh, a little further than if they say, well, that was just one guy in a focus group that you know, manipulated everybody. And there's ways around that. You know, how do we know we have a large enough sample? But when you've got 30 people all doing exactly the same thing, exactly at the same time, and, and it's right there in living color. Um, they tend to be swayed now. And it's, so in some ways, it's a pedagogical way. You know, um, say, well, like my very first job was for a TV, um, a, a free job, um, where I've been sitting in El Paso watching the same commercial, never changed for the last 23 years. You know, go to Dick Poe, and cars everywhere, very confusing. And they came in and I said, I looked at for something that was positive out of this. And it turned out to be Dick Poe himself. Now Dick Poe is in his late 90s. And we're still, we have cartoons of Dick Poe now. 